Last week we started uh, a series in, in, in this science of the supernatural. John G. Lake, when he uh, began to pray and he began to minister in the early 1900s all throughout uh, Africa and then even to the U.S., uh, he was just seeing miraculous healings and miracles take place uh, just off the scales, off the charts. And uh, somebody asked him, he said, what's going on? Why, why is there such a manifestation of the presence of God and miracles Every, everywhere you go, just these miraculous healings and, and recovery? Matter of fact, uh, the church, when he, when he came to the U.S. in uh, Spokane, Washington, uh, it was noticed when he, when he got there after like three years after he got there, it was noted as the healthiest city in America. America. And so he started these healing rooms and healing schools and training healing technicians uh, using the Word of God. And uh, they asked him, they said, what's the secret to, to your success? And he said, I asked the Lord not just for a miracle, not just to be able to operate in healing and, and miracle, but I asked the Lord to help me to understand the science of healing, how it works. The same way that, that Solomon, when he asked the Lord for wisdom, he asked the Lord for wisdom, knowledge, understanding, so that he could be able to govern what God had given him. In other words, what Solomon say, was saying was, God, it's not just more that I'm after. We want more, don't we? But we also want to be able to steward and govern what God has already given us so that when the more comes, we'll be able to steward that. Amen? Amen. So I began to ask the Lord, if John G. Lake could ask you for the science of healing and you give him that revelation, I want to ask you for uh, the, the science of the supernatural. I want to know how it all works. <laughs> <laughs> he got he got the revelation on healing and that's awesome I, I just want to know how the whole realm of the supernatural works and so the Lord has just been speaking to me for the past month or so on and we started this uh, two Sunday nights ago in the Holy Spirit encounter understanding the difference between faith anointing and glory so this is message really message number two or two and a half or three uh, in that series of understanding faith, anointing, and glory, which are three components of operating in the supernatural, which what we call supernatural is God's natural. And if we are in Christ, that should be our natural. Amen? So... <clears throat> Uh, last week, we talked about seven levels of faith because uh, before we can understand the science of supernatural, we have to understand how faith works. Last week, we talked about seven levels of faith. If you missed that one, you can check it out uh, on live stream for last week. You can also check out our YouTube channel. Uh, but today, we're going to go a little bit deeper in the component of faith, and we're going to talk about developing our faith because so many times I have people to talk to me after service or during the week and say, I hear what you're saying about this component of faith, uh, but I'm not there yet. How do I grow? How do I develop in my faith? And so this message is, is one of those in response to those questions. One of the most common questions that I get is, how do I grow in faith? How do I develop my faith? Is that something that you would be interested in learning? Oh, yeah. Well, whether you're interested in it or not, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just glad that you're interested in it. That, that's awesome. Uh, Kenneth Hagin said something years ago. He said, faith begins where the will of God is known. Once we know, once we have an understanding of what the will of God is for our life, we can then have faith to move out in the direction. I love what Kenneth Copeland said. He said, he said you, you, can't even, you can't even start to pray about something until you've already determined what the will of God is unless you're trying to pray to ask what the will is. <laughs> 
Because if you're unsure about what the will of God is for a particular area in your life, you'll never be able to move out in faith on something that you don't have clarity concerning the will of God. If you think God is allowing you to get sick to teach you a lesson, you will never be able to receive healing in your body. Because you'll think that what the enemy is doing to you is God and you'll be okay with it. If you think poverty is a blessing and poverty is next to godliness, then you will never be at a place to where you will be able to be a blessing financially to those who are around you. If you think poverty is a gift from God, if you look in the book of Galatians and if you look in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, there's three curses of the law. There's three curses. Curse number one is sickness. Curse number two is poverty. Curse number three is death. And the Bible says in Galatians that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He's redeemed us from the curse of sickness, from the curse of poverty, and from the curse of death. <laughs> so when we begin to discover what the will of God is, we can start stepping out in faith in those areas. Romans 10, 17 says it like this. So faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. What you are hearing, what you are listening to is determining if your faith is increasing or decreasing. Those who are not capable of increasing you will inevitably decrease you. Galatians 5 and 6 says that faith works by love. So if you want faith to come alive on the inside of your heart, Paul said in Ephesians 1 that we have to have an understanding that we are rooted and grounded in the love of God. The love of God is the source in which all gifts, fruits, manifestations of the spirit function. Paul said, if I have the gift of tongues, if I have the gift of faith to be able to speak to mountains, if I could do all of these great things, if I don't have, then I'm just making a bunch of noise. I'm tired of making a bunch of noise. I want to be able to speak effectively. I want to be able to demonstrate the manifestation of the kingdom of God right here, right now, so that it would be on earth just like it is in heaven. But it's going to take some love. You're going to have marvelous opportunities to step out of the love of God. How many had a marvelous opportunity on your way to church this morning? You had this great opportunity just to step out of the love of God and get in the flesh. The rest of you are aligned. You'll have marvelous opportunities to walk in strife, to be bitter, to be angry, to be jealous. All of those things is to get you to a place to where you're out of love so that your faith won't work. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says it like this, so that we walk by faith and not by sight. We don't walk by what we can just see with our natural eyes. We walk by faith. There is something that comes alive on the inside of our hearts uh, when we say, in spite of what it looks like externally, I know what God is doing on the inside of me. And what he's doing on the inside of me is greater than anything that could come against me so I can continue to walk uh, not by what I see, but what my faith is telling me on the inside. Have you ever just known something and you don't know how you know it and you don't know why you know it? You just know uh, this is something Thing that the Lord is dropping into my heart. Faith just comes alive on the inside of you. I'm walking by the revelation of faith, not by what I can see or experience with my five senses. Jesus says in Matthew 17 and 20 that faith can move mountains. So we get to this place in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 12, where I will actually begin. I think I already begun, but here's my official beginning. Um, 1 Timothy 6 and 12 says it like this. Look to your neighbor and say he's talking to us. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of the eternal life to which you were summoned. You were summoned to eternal life. That's awesome. 
you confess the good confession of faith before many witnesses. The first point that we're going to look at this morning is that we are fighting a good fight. Somebody say good. good. It's a good fight that we're fighting. Now, how many's ever been in a fist fight before? Once again, we still have people lying in the house. I don't know why. <laughs> Take it from experience from those of us who have been in fights before. A good fight is a fight that you win. I mean, you come home from school and say, Dad, I got in a good fight today. <laughs> it's just a setup saying, I just kicked somebody's butt. <laughs> I won. Um, a good fight is a fight that we win. But notice what he says here. He does not say that we're fighting the devil. He does not say that we're fighting sin or oppression, or depression, or sickness, or what have you. But he says what we're fighting is the good fight of faith. Many times people, uh, I hear them often talk to me, and, 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 and I understand what they're saying, but it's still incorrect what they're saying. When they come and say, listen, I need you to pray for me because I've been fighting the devil all week. And in my mind, I'm saying, you ain't fighting the devil. <laughs> you ain't. Number one, you're no match for him in your own self and in your own ability. And number two, Jesus already won that battle 2,000 years ago. And if you are in him and he is in you, there's no fight left in him. The devil ain't got no fight left in him. There's no fight to it. And we have this imagery of Jesus in this corner and the devil in this corner. And Jesus punches the devil and the devil falls back and he gets up and punches Jesus. And Jesus falls down and gets back up and they're going to. There was, that's not how it works. Jesus just speaks the word and he's done. But yet in our minds, we have this understanding that we're scrapping it out, man. We're just going and going and going. And in reality, when we're talking about fighting the good fight of faith, is the fight to maintain our confession of faith. That's what the good fight of faith is all about. How many have ever heard of the evangelist R.W. Schambach? I know when I was little, my dad would take us to Atlanta. I remember probably being just a teenager, maybe a preteen, and taking us all, hopping us all in. The, we, had, we had this Toyota station wagon. <laughs> and he would pile us in that Toyota station wagon. And I remember going to Atlanta, and R.W. Schambach had the tent set up there. And it, he had the tent set up, and when I pulled up, when we pulled up into the parking lot, I thought, man, this is like, this is crazy, because this tent would seat like 10,000 people, and there were like that many people there. And I thought, I've never, I didn't know there was this many people who were saved in the earth. <laughs> I mean, I mean, because the way you hear a lot of people talking, you know, they're, well, let's get off of that. And so anyway, I remember him as a little boy, and, and he began to minister. And one of his taglines at the end of every message was, you don't have any problems. All you need is faith in God. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. In my mind, I wish it always worked that way. But in reality, it does work that way. Y'all got quiet. But he began to tell a story about understanding what it's like to overcome and to be an overcomer and to be more than an overcomer. And he said, if you could have these two guys who are boxers who step into the ring and both of these guys are tending for the crown. They're tending for the belt of world champion. And they both step into the ring. Big, muscular guys. They go in here. They're athletic. They're ready. They've been training for this. They go into the ring. 
And as they go into the ring, they fight. And for 12 rounds, they do. They, they halfway kill each other. But at the end, after it's all said and done, one guy walks away with his hands raised saying, you are the world champion. And then they come out here with this big old check that says, oh, you just got $20 million or $50 million or whatever that purse is. That guy in that ring became a conqueror. But then he takes that $20 million check back home to his little five foot one, 103 pound wife and turns around and puts that check over to her and says, here you go, baby. Now watch it. That guy was the conqueror, but she was more than a conqueror. Yeah. See, that's why <laughs> some of y'all men, y'all like, mm-hmm. <laughs> And that's what Jesus did. He fought the fight at Calvary 2,000 years ago. He already won the victory. And then he turns around and says, you are now more than an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. You get all the benefits and all the rewards of what I did at Calvary over 2,000 years ago. Are you thankful for the blood of Jesus? Hallelujah. So the first thing that we see, we are fighting a good fight. That means we've already won, so the struggle is over. Just prophesy to your neighbor right now and tell him, your struggle's over. You've already, you've already won. The battle is already won. So if we are fighting the good fight of faith, what is that good fight? Number two, here's what the fight is all about. To maintain our confession of faith. Three times in the book of Hebrews, we are charged to hold fast, to maintain our confession of faith. So we maintain that. We continue to hold on to that confession. What is that confession? Well, Hebrews 4 and 12 says it like this. The word of God is quick. It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing asunder the soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, and the discerner of the intents of the heart. So then we have this high priest that is passed into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let's hold fast to our profession. So here's, here's what we do. We're looking to Jesus, but we're holding on to our confession. We're looking to Jesus, but we're not coming out of agreement with our confession of faith. You see, because when you begin to confess, you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. Let's go ahead, number three. So we release faith from our heart to our mouth. So it starts in our heart, but it starts coming out of our mouth. And Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you want to find out what's inside of somebody's heart, all you got to do is just listen to what they say. Just listen to what they say. Listen to what they're talking about. Because you're going to hear what's going on inside of our heart by listening to the words that are coming out of their mouth. So watch this. Romans 10, 8 through 10 says that when we are born again, we believe in our hearts and we confess Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord. He is Savior of our lives. Now notice, he does not say, <laughs> he does not say what you believe in your mind and confess with your mouth, but he says what you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. He didn't say, out of the abundance of your mind, your mouth starts speaking. But he says, what's going on inside of your heart? So faith is birthed inside of our heart. In other words, how many born-again believers are we having in here today? The rest of y'all going to get saved before the service is over. Now watch this. Did you, did you see Jesus... 2,000 years ago, take the stripes for your healing outside of watching Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion. 
You weren't there. You didn't see him take the stripes. You didn't see him hanging between heaven and earth. But yet, when the gospel was preached, something convicted your heart, not your mind, but your heart, that what was being said was true, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he lived a perfect, spotless life, that he was crucified, he was buried, and he is resurrected, and he is coming back again. You didn't figure all that out in your mind. You figured it out in your heart. You see, because in your heart you can go places uh, that your mind can't go there yet. Oh, I just said something right there. <clears throat> so it starts in our heart and then it transitions to our mouth. So faith, again, number one, We're fighting the good fight of faith. We're maintaining our confession of faith. We're releasing our faith. Faith is released through the spoken word. In in Romans chapter number 10, 8, it says salvation, deliverance, breakthrough, healing, wholeness, all of that is in your mouth. Romans 10 and 8, all that's in your mouth. Did you realize that? Your salvation is in your mouth. Your healing is in your mouth. Your deliverance is in your mouth. So if we can have what we say, according to Mark 11, 23 and 24, if we can have what we say, why are we just saying what we have? All of this, it starts in your heart, but it transitions to our mouth. Now, James chapter number 3 compares our tongue to three things. Compares our tongue to the rudder of a ship. Compares our tongue to the bridle inside of a horse's mouth. And it also compares our tongue to like kindling to a fire. How many fire builders do we have in the house? I'm talking people who just love to build fires. That's me. If I wasn't saved, I would burn everything down. (laughs) Blow everything up. (laughs) Fourth of July is my favorite time of year. Why? Because I get to blow up stuff. (laughs) But all you fire builders know you don't take a big log... And, and, and just try to catch that thing on fire. You take a bunch of little pieces of wood. Here's Fire Building 101. <laughs> you take a bunch of little ones and you get them going. And you put some a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger until finally it gets to the place where it's so hot, no matter what you put on it, will catch on fire and burn. Now, notice what it says about the tongue. The tongue is like kindling. In other words, whatever fire you want to get started starts with your tongue. Notice it don't end with the tongue, but it starts with the tongue. So verse 9 in Romans 10 says it like this. What we confess, we believe. He says, confess it, believe it, then experience it. Confess it, believe it, experience it. Mark eleven twenty three and 24 tells us, like, as Jesus was saying, he says, have faith in God. Or, or the actual Greek translation is have the God kind of faith. Now, Jesus is sitting here talking to him. And he says, I want, I'm talking to you guys, have the God kind of faith. I'm like, whoa, you mean that's possible? Because if you're telling me to do something, then that means what you're telling me to do is actually possible for me to do. And he's saying, have the God kind of faith. Whatever you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, you're going to have whatever you say. In that passage of scripture, he talks, he uses the word believe one time, but he uses the word you have what you say two to three times, depending on what translation you use. So you think your belief has to be up here so your confession can be up here. 
But he's saying if your belief is right here, you just keep confessing it because what's happening is as you confess it, your believing is rising to that level so that you can begin to experience the thing that you're saying. So somebody said to me one time, said, well, why I don't understand this? Well, I, I, okay, listen, pastor, if I say something negative, it happens real quick. But if I say something positive, it takes that forever to take place. Why is that? And I said, it's because you're more developed in speaking negative things than you are positive things. And a lot of us are frustrated because we're more developed in speaking the curse. Remember, the power of death and life is in the tongue. Starts off because we are more, we have a proclivity to speak death more than we do life. And, and, and so as we are developed in speaking life and speaking what God has said and what he is saying, the more developed we are in that, the quicker we'll see what we are saying manifest. So he says uh, our heart believes it, receives it, our mouth confesses it, then we experience. Now, what's interesting in the New Testament there, sometimes he says you believe it first, you confess it next, then you receive it. But then there's some places where it says confess it until you believe it and then receive it. Oh, man, this is good stuff. This is worth the price of admission right here. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you're sitting here thinking, man, I wish I could just believe. Oh, I'll help you believe. Start speaking in the direction that you want to start believing in. Start speaking the direction that you want to start believing until that begins. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You're saying it, you're hearing it, and faith is coming alive on the inside of you every single time. Romans chapter number 3, verse number 3. If I have faith to believe God for something and somebody don't have faith or they are speaking against my faith, does their negativity or does their lack of faith affect God's promises becoming real in my life? Absolutely not. Romans 3 and 3, let the word of God be true and let everybody else be a liar. So what will happen if I'm speaking what God has said and he is saying and somebody else is speaking against that, their negativity is not going to make the word of God ineffective in my life. But it is going to make it ineffective in their life. So number four, put your faith in action. Now let's, let's look through this. Mark chapter number four and five gives us three examples of this. Jesus said to the disciples in Mark chapter number 4, verse number 35, after ministering on the parable of the seed and sower, he said when the, when the seed is sown, the word is sown, immediately the enemy comes in to take it out. And he says, we're going to the other side, Mark 4, 35. We're going to the other side. But in the middle of transition, a storm arose. How many has ever started out something and it was real smooth when you started out, but then it got real rocky when you got into it. This is why. This is why. Jesus said the word is the seed. And immediately the enemy comes in to steal that seed, to take it out. Remember, the battle is over our faith. Our confession to get us out of confessing, to get us out of agreement with what God has said and what he's saying. Now, Jesus said we're going to the other side. In the middle of that, a storm rose up. And in the middle of it, in the middle of adversity, the, cha the disciples changed their confession. Their confession changed from we're going to the other side to we're going to die. <laughs> How many times have you ever changed your confession in the middle of a storm? All of us started out saying one thing. You're very positive. You're very high. You're speaking the faith. You're speaking the promises. Uh, but then you start having some adversity, and boom, confession changes. See, that's... <laughs> I saw a light bulbs just going off. 
That's what the fight is all about. That's what the good fight of faith is about. Maintaining our confession when adversity comes against us and it don't look like it's going to take place. Because Jesus said we're going to the other side, but now there's a storm. Now the disciples change their confession to, we're going to die. And Jesus got up and said, <laughs> yes. And the disciples got Jesus up. And Jesus spoke to the wind, and he spoke to the waves. He spoke to the invisible realm first, and then he spoke to the visible realm. He spoke to what could be seen. He spoke to what could not be seen, but he spoke to the invisible realm first. He spoke to the wind. You see, there is a spiritual hook connected to everything that's manifested in the natural realm. And so Jesus, more in-depth teaching on that soon. Jesus says, he speaks to the storm, the storm obeyed. So now, the next example we see of that is Jairus in Mark chapter number 5, verse 23. Jairus made the confession. He made a faith confession. Mark 5, 23. Jesus, if you will lay your hands upon my daughter, she's going to get healed. That was his confession. Jesus said, okay, I'll come. I can work with that. I'll come to your house. I'll lay my hands on her, and she'll get, she'll get healed. In transition to Jesus going to Jairus' house, a servant runs up and says, Hey, no need to bother Jesus anymore. Jairus, your daughter just died. Now, before Jairus could respond or react, Jesus looks at Jairus and gives Jairus the Michael Watkins unabridged translation and said, Don't listen to that, tra Don't listen to that trash. We, we still going. We still going. We still going. And Jesus walks in there, puts his hands on the dead daughter now. Notice, notice sometimes when you make faith confessions, the situation that was bad sometimes transitions to worse. Why? That's part of the process. I don't want you to get hung up in the middle of the process and think that you can't believe God for something. But because every time you start believing for him for something, there's going to be opposition. There's going to be storms. There's going to be warfare. And that warfare is simply to get you out of your confession and into agreement with the enemy so that what you're believing for will never take place. That's what the battle is all about. Jarius had that confession. Jesus, you put your hands on my daughter, boom, she's going to get healed. That was his confession. Obstacles, circumstances came to see if Jarius was going to come out of agreement with what he had already said. How many times have we came out of agreement with what we've already said? Shout now. All right. Mark 5, 28. Another example, I could, get, I could do this all day, I could do this all day, but I won't, I'm, I'm just hitting some highlights. Mark 5, 28, the woman with the issue of blood, she made a confession. If I can do what? Touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to be made whole. That was her confession. What happened when she touched the hem of his garment? She was healed, she was made whole. I believe that if she said, if I can just get within a 50-foot parameter of Jesus, I'll be made whole. I believe she said, if she'd have just said, if I can get a mile away from Jesus, I'll be made whole. Whatever. See, too many times we put too many hoops for us to jump through to see a manifestation of the kingdom of God take place. Some of you are saying, if I can just fast 40 days, I'm going to get a breakthrough. If I can just pray for 29 hours and 46 minutes straight, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is, 
If I could just read the Bible all the way through. Oh, if I could just go down to Texas to that meeting that they're having over there. If I could just fly up to Toronto to go to that service over there. If I could just go to Jacksonville and, that, and, and you put all of these stipulations and then you get there and it happens just like you said it did that you was going to get healed when you got there. It happens just like that. But it would have happened also if you had just said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Let the word of God be true and everything else be a lie. Look to your neighbor and say, quit giving yourself hoops to jump through. Quit giving yourself hoops to jump through. You're making up all of these things and all these scenarios that have to happen. Well, if I could just get enough friends on Facebook. If I could just get enough people who would like me. If I could just get a raise on my job. If I could just get a new house. If I could just get... We put all these stipulations that's got to be in place before we can see a manifestation of the kingdom of God. But what would happen if we just took God's word at face value and said, okay, that settles it. He said, I am healed. I am healed. He said that poverty is broke off of my life. It's broke off of my life. Come on. <laughs> yes. Yes, 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 yes. So number five, last and final point, but I could go on this one for days, <laughs> but I won't. Quit trying to figure it out. Quit trying to figure it out. Remember, it's not what we're believing in our mind. It's what we're believing in our heart. But see, what happens many times is by the time we get to the end of the process, we try to start figuring it out in our mind. You know, if God told you that in five months and three days and four hours and 26 minutes, your husband was going to meet a man at his job who was going to witness to him, and your husband was going to get saved, and that everything was going to be radically changed from that point forward, I promise you, you wouldn't take that word promise you wouldn't take that word and just sit on it and pray on it and, and and pray let it be so God just like you spoke in it no you're going to be looking up that guy on Facebook you're going to be doing you're going to be doing background checks on him you're going to try to find out his relatives his cousin his uncle how many times he's been arrested you're going to try to try to figure out everything and then when you get enough information, then you're going to reach out and, and you're going to call him up on, on the phone and say, Hey, John, I just got a word from the Lord. And he's like, Who are you? And then you start speaking in tongues and prophesying. Shatakala. And he's like, What are you saying? What is, what is going on? What you don't realize is he hadn't been saved yet. He's going to get saved two more days. And because you tried to jump into the process, because you, you're trying to figure it out in your mind. Why can't we just take what, I feel the Holy Ghost up in here. Why can't we just take what God said and believe it and trust the process and understand what he said? He's going to do what he said. He's going to bring it to pass. He's going to do it not by might or by power, but it's going to be by his spirit. Come on and give him a praise. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, quit trying to figure it out and just believe. Quit trying to figure it out. Quit trying to figure it out. God told Moses in Numbers, I'm trying to stop. God told Moses in Numbers chapter number 11, he said, I'm going to give these 600,000 people meat to eat. They had been eating manna for 40 plus days and they were complaining because they was tired of the manna. And God spoke to Moses and he said, I'm going to give enough meat for all of them to eat, all 600,000 of these foot soldiers. And if there's 600,000 foot soldiers, there's at least 3 million plus people because you got mamas and daddies and brothers and sisters. And God just told Moses, I'm fixing to feed all these people. Y'all didn't hear that. I'm going to feed them. 
Now you would have thought with the track record that Moses had with God that God could have just told Moses that and Moses would be like, cool. All right. Moses had just saw 10 plagues supernaturally displayed in all of Egypt where not one of those plagues affected the Israelites. They have total darkness in Egypt for three days. But in Goshen, 10 miles down the road, they're sitting out there with suntan lotion in their their lawn chairs just soaking up the sun. They got frogs over here in Egypt, uh, and they're sitting over here in Goshen and thinking, oh, man, I hear these frogs over there. (laughs) Such a separation of distinction between the people of God and the Egyptians. And I know people starting to say it's getting darker and darker, but I want to tell you this. It's going to be just like it was when God brought the Israelites out of Egypt. It's Charles Dickinson said it the best when he said it was the best of times and it was the worst of the times. For the people of God, it's going to be the best of times. But for the world, God's going to put a distinction between the world and his people and his bride is going to arise and shine in this hour. Come on and give God some praise. You're going to recognize the Christian businesses because there's going to be the ones uh, who are taking over. You're going to recognize the people who are following Jesus because it's going to be the glory of God that's going to be manifested in their lives. Moses just saw literally 40 days prior all of these plagues, the Red Sea, walk right across on dry land, You would think after having like 60 days of extreme miracles and everything that God telling was going to take place and instantly seeing that. I'm not talking about hearing a prophecy and then 40 years later it comes to pass. I'm talking about hearing God say, I'm going to do this. And then then as soon as he gets done saying it, it happens. All of that. And then now they're in the wilderness out of Egypt. And God says, I'm fixing to feed all these people meat. They're going to have some tomahawk steaks cooked on the pellet grill, slowly smoked for two hours, then then reverse seared so that when you cut that thing, mm, the juice just flows. You would have thought. That's what I had yesterday, y'all. It was so good. (laughs) Okay. God said, I'm going to feed these people meat. And then, and then Moses says, are all of the flocks and herds going to be slain to feed them? Is there enough fish in the sea to be gathered to feed all these people? Now, you might be looking at Moses and saying, Moses, you a fool. <laughs> you know, saw God do all these things in 60 days. And now he's just telling you, not that I'm going to split the Red Sea, not that I'm going to rain fire down or I'm going to stop the sun from shining, but I'm just simply going to feed the people because they're hungry. I'm just telling you what I'm going to do. And then then, then, then Moses saying, God, I don't know about that. But watch this. God wasn't asking Moses to figure it out. Moses tried to start figuring it out. Where's all this food going to come from? Are there that many fish into the sea? Or how is this going to take place? Look, God wasn't asking Moses to figure it out. He was just asking Moses to simply agree with him that what he said he was going to do. We have a tendency to try to want to start figuring it out, working these scenarios into our minds. But God brought you into this house this morning to say, quit trying to figure it out. Quit trying to figure it out. Come on. Quit trying to figure it out. Numbers 11, 23, God said unto Moses, is my hand waxed short? Do you think that my hand has got any shortages in it? 
You know, people get mad and say, well, you shouldn't seek the hand of God. You should seek the face of God. I can't find one place in the Bible where God rebuked anybody for seeking his hand. But I ain't going to argue with you. Let's go. Is my hand waxed short? Is my hand waxed short? He said, you're going to see whether it's going to come to pass or not. Quit trying to figure it out and just believe what I said is true. It's going to happen. <laughs> 